this episode of Property Journal, I'm talking to Naeem Hanif. Naeem is brutally honest about his journey in business, both the highs and the lows, and is really open about his mental health and the effects that it had at crucial times. He also talks about his property investment journey and the fact that at this moment in time, he is content and happy in his life. There's a lot to learn here about resilience and persistency. I really hope you enjoy this episode. Naeem, welcome to Property Channel. Thank you for joining me. Hi, John. So tell me a bit about yourself. So um, I'm Naeem. I've got uh, two lovely daughters in their 20s. Um, I'm transitioning through uh, my businesses at the moment, but my former life, I was in the motor industry. I had franchise car dealerships. That was my main stay of my business. How long ago was that name? So I started the business in December of 1996 sure. in West London okay. uh, with my first dealership. Um, before that, I worked in the motor industry. Um, I had made a name for myself, starting off as a salesperson actually, in West London, and I'd done particularly well there. That progressed to management, like a lot of people. Um, Within a couple of years, I, I was the youngest dealer principal for Honda at the time in, in the country. That was a very successful business and people took note of that. So I made a name for myself by turning around a, what was then a broken business. And that led to me wanting to do something for myself. Um, and with that in mind, I approached a couple of the manufacturers and back in those days, there was something called a seed capital program. You had to come up with a little bit of money. Mm. Um, if you had a, something of a reputation, um, they would sponsor you. You'd have to go to an assessment center, spend a couple of days there, and then that would follow on. Um, and the manufacturers would front the money yeah. for you to have a business of your own. Um, and that's how I got into uh, my own business. So how many staff did you end up having within these businesses and at what point did it get to you know, the, the, sort of the size that I know it got to before? Uh... So John, it, look, it started off with one, one dealership. Yeah. Um, when you put together all the departments of a dealership, that's service, parts, vehicle technicians, sales, um, that can be, depending on the size of the outfit, that can be 30, 40 staff. Sure. So but what happened with me is very early on, the first business turned a profit in year one, which was ahead of mm. schedule. And that led to the manufacturers wanting more, which was great. So at the end of year one, we opened our second dealership, which was a brand new purpose-built facility. And um, very quickly, that led to number three and then number four. And all I was doing was replicating what we'd started with in the first and trying to spread that culture across all of our businesses. Yeah. And that culture came from yourself and your ethos and values? or Yeah, so for me, I mean, culture is a word that's banded around all the time. But mm -hmm. ultimately, for me, I think culture is when your values uh, align with your beliefs and that manifests in a behavior yeah. within an organization that is emulated throughout your your people your staff sure and if you can create a positive vibrant culture in any organization then that's the beginning of something you know really yeah. really special can you elaborate on those values because that's something i really wanted to delve into hmm. you, know, you you ordered, you, know, you were clearly building what became a successful business. And I can imagine the staff and the people around you were enjoying working with you, but what did you do and what values and ethos did you sort of instill so, into the company? Above all else, I, um, it sounds corny, but I do genuinely value people. And m the team that I started with, many of which I'm still in touch with today, amazing people. Mm. Um, they, they always felt, I'd like to believe that they felt that we're all part of something mm. that was going somewhere. So that was the first thing. 
But also, um, in terms of values, you asked the question about values. It was important to me that we were genuinely better at delivering outstanding customer service and trying to encapsulate that in a culture. I mean, how many times car dealerships, you know, aren't known for great service, let's be honest. Most of the time it's a distressed purchase and, you know, the business has changed so much over the last couple of decades. But there was so much scope to be better than everybody else. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't difficult to do. For me, that culture, to go back to that, needed to start from me at the helm sure. and spread across um, everyone in the business. And the way that I put it to the staff, it's pretty fresh in my mind actually, um, is this. I needed to think of a hook line, something that encapsulates the values of the business in a simple sentence that everybody could remember. And for me, that was famous for keeping our promises. So I put it to the staff. We actually had a whiteboard one day and we wrote down all of our values, you know, whatever they might be. Sure. Integrity, doing the thing that we said we would do, um, keeping our promises, being nice to one another, being respectful, all of those things that, you know, should be the norm for everybody. Um, but including everyone without a hierarchy. So whether that was me or the car validators or the cleaners, Everyone within that business, certainly the first two or three businesses, felt they had a role um, and that they were playing an important part, regardless of what they were doing. It could have been the driver that yeah. you know, took the cars. That was an important role. It had to arrive on time. It had to come back in the way that it you know, left and so on and so forth. Um, and I encapsulated that in, that in that line, famous for keeping our promises. So you're leading by example. You sound like you've got a, a motivated team. You're, you're trucking along. Businesses are successful. Um, you know, what, what then changed for you? Where, where, you know, where does the journey go from, from there? We were asked to look at a group of uh, businesses. So in the past, I'd always taken over a single premises. Mm and tried to make that right before moving on. It was a formula that had worked. This was a group of um, dealerships that really wasn't functioning well. Okay. And to my mind, a broken business is one that's alienated its database through really bad service. Excuse me, and that was the, the case here. Um, after some prevarication, a lot of thinking, I, I did the deal and we took over this group. We doubled our size overnight. And that, what was easy to run, became very difficult almost overnight. Um, it became a little bit unwieldy and fixing it was much, much harder because we had spread that core nucleus of values mm. and people and I was giving it my best, but it was proving very difficult to get the traction that we wanted. And when I look back, um, that was probably a mistake. But we carried on growing. You know, yeah. there was some manufacturer support, and we became multi-franchised. Yeah. Um, some of our premises were dual franchised. And so we ended up in a place a few years later where the company was now circa 400 employees with um, multi-franchised operations mm -hmm. around the M25 as far out as Reading and became a much more complex animal okay. than it had ever been. Running one brand is one thing, but running sure. six, seven brands dealing with the Japanese, the Koreans, the Germans, whatever, you know, put that all in a melting pot, yeah. became very complex. And then we went headlong into the credit crunch. Yeah. And the ironic thing about that, and I remember the day actually, I think it was the week before Lehman Brothers fell, 
I remember walking the dogs with a really good friend of mine um, around the corner and I'd made a decision in my own head. I'd had some personal issues. My partner was uh, really unwell um, and with long-term illness. And much of the fun and love for the business was waning. And we'd made money. Um, we were in a comfortable position, you know, I had, you know, all the things that go with that, the entrapments, sure. the lovely home and whatever. And I remember walking the dogs that day and saying to a good friend, you know, I've made a decision this week. And uh, he said, yeah, what's that? He said, I'm out. I'm going to, I'm going to start working to sell the business, whatever that might mean. I want to live my life differently. And we had this, uh, we had this meaningful this DMC, if you like, yep. that was out. And I made that decision, and I think two days later, Lehman Brothers fell. Oh. Um, timing. Timing is, a, is an absolute crucial part of life, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I mean, my life was in a, in a tailspin. It was for a lot of people. We weren't alone. But my company was, um, had grown massively. In recent years, we weren't an established, you know, in, in lots of our locations. And the rot set in because um, I think at the time I had something ridiculous like three million pounds in four wheel drives. And, you know, the four wheel drive market, you know, people forget this, all just disappeared. There were manufacturers put bonuses behind all the um, four-wheel drives just to get rid of them. And we were trading, essentially, uh, to lose money. Right. It couldn't have come at a worse time. No. And, my God, you know, everything that we had built in terms of net worth since 1996, which was still within the company, and it was a, it was a fair amount of money, yeah. we lost in the space of uh, months... Um, we were hemorrhaging money at a rate of knots that um, was just a frightening time. You it know? sounds, yeah, and very demoralizing. Incredibly it was social. demoralizing. Um, and Sean, you have to remember at this stage, the architect of famous for keeping our promises, I had made commitments to people that I cared about um, the staff, yeah, and in that scenario, the first thing that generally goes is headcount. Yeah, and of course, I sat there with the accountants, and the you know, and we we looked at everything. We started cutting costs left, right, and centre. And there was, in fairness, fat in the business that. You know, we 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 could cut. Um, our salespeople were, um, as an average, yeah. earning thirty five percent more with us than if they left and went to work for one of the premium brands at that time. Okay. I was aware of that, but it was a conscious thing because a large proportion of their earnings was clearly on commission. Yeah. Our Christmas parties were outrageous. Mm -hmm. People still talk about them today. You know, um, you know, I, I used to pay for everything. The company did, not me personally. From a credit crunch point of view and all the, 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 the way you headed into it, um, the effects on the business must have been awful. And of course, I want to talk to you about how that affected you as well, just in terms of your, your mental health and all the things that were going on around you, how that affected the family. Yeah. So, yes, it was, uh, it was profound to say, mm. you know, if you put to one side the, um, the business for a moment and the fact that we were hemorrhaging money, um, Telephone numbers. I mean, I couldn't bear to get the call from the accountants to see how much we'd lost in a monthly basis. And at one stage, we didn't even know whether we were going to be able to pay, make payroll. Okay. You know, it was a fortune. But on a personal 
level. Um, my second daughter was born in January of 2000. And when she was about a year old, um, my partner became very sick. So the credit crunch was 2008. I had already taken a quite a toll on the fact that my partner was ill and unable to function bedridden in and out of hospital for months at a time. And I now had two little girls at home um, who were and still are my world. And I was trying to be all things to all people. So that meant running the business, coming home, doing what's required at home, um, taking the girls away from what was a really difficult um, environment at home. Mm. And um, doing all the things that, you know, any, any parent would do. And, but it was relentless. Um, and I kept telling myself that it's fine, it will all come together because I was still partly in the mode of I can achieve anything, somewhat naively, somewhat arrogantly, uh, perhaps. But it took its toll um, on me. And I hadn't realized at the time, but I was, I wasn't functioning. Gradually, I, I lost my ability to think clearly. Uh, things that came to me naturally in terms of problem solving or solutions. There was no part of my life, John, that I could look at and say, well, that's okay. I know now that I was clinically depressed. I wasn't functioning, I wasn't sleeping. Um, and there was a period where, a long period, where I, I hated my existence. Um, Out of interest, did you seek help at that time? So did you, for yourself, did you actually go and have any um, counselling or, or talk to anyone? <laughs> so John, to help? what is happened with me is, um, like a lot of people, I guess, especially, well, I don't know if this is true, but I, uh, I was very hard on myself. I was frustrated. Um, my partner, in fairness to her, um, thankfully, she made an appointment for me to go and see uh, the doctor. This was at a very low point. I was angry because I didn't want to go to see the doctor. I went begrudgingly and um, I met this GP uh, who sat with me and said, um, I gave him quite a hard time, mm. you know, and, and he said, look, will you humor me and go and see this fella, um, Tim Cantifer? And I said, why would I do that? And he said, I've known him for 35 years. He's an amazing doctor and I've got a feeling you'll like him. Just do it for me. And so I went very begrudgingly <laughs> um, to see Tim Cantifer. And Tim shared this doctor, Tim Cantifer, an amazing guy. Um, he said two or three things to me that really stood out, that made me I wasn't an easy patient. I really gave him a hard time. I was with him for nearly two hours in the first appointment, but he was patient enough to sit with me. And he said that I was clinically depressed and said, you know, I want to put you on whatever it was at the time, these uh, antidepressants, which I immediately declined because that's for weak people. Um, you know, I'm not going to take antidepressants. You know, I have a business. I can do this. I can do that. And look at my achievements. And he said, um, the thing that really got me in that first meeting was that people often think of clinical depression just purely as a mental health issue. But he said it's a physical manifestation of... Um, a series of things that have happened in your life. And I remember his words. He said, if I take you to see my nurse next door and we take a lumbar puncture right now, 
right this instant. This was at the Priory. He said, I'll be able to demonstrate to you that the chemicals in your mind, your brain, are not firing the way that a, they should be. Sure. I can prove that to you under a microscope. And he said, and this is how he described it, uh, the analogy he used, he said, have you ever had a polo mint? I said, well, of course I have. He said, when you put a polo mint in your mouth, he said, if you don't bite on it and you just suck on that mint, he said, that mint gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Then eventually it breaks into three or four different pieces. He said, you've got something called a limbic system in your brain. And he said, imagine your limbic system is that polo mint. He said, what's happened is it's broken, Noeem. And therefore, the chemicals in your brain aren't functioning, uh, firing as they should. He said, the antidepressants aren't the be all and the end all. But what I believe they will do for you is gradually get the chemicals firing again until our hope is that the polo reforms and you'll be able to manage your business, deal with your personal life and function for a while in order to get through this period. I had a huge stigma about it because I couldn't get past, and this is partly my conditioning from, I guess, you know, the way I was brought up, you know, we were, my father was an incredibly strong man, uh, you know, uh, had a huge impact on uh, all of our lives as kids. And there was part of me that thought that I, if I did this, I would be a failure. Because I wasn't strong enough to do it without. Anyway, I, I left uh, Tim Cantifer's office. I went home and I reflected on everything he said and um, I bought his book. I had to check it out for myself. And anyway, the title of his book um, is Depression, Curse of the Strong. Dr. Cantifer's belief was the profile, the average profile, statistically speaking, for um, people that suffer from depression, whilst varied, a large part of it is super strong people. People that have taken on so much strain over a prolonged period of time that the limbic system in their brain has broken the polo mint. And I read this over, you know, a week or so, this book, and a few weeks on from the appointment, nothing had changed for me. I was kidding myself. I wasn't functioning. So I went back to see him and he put me on whatever it was at the time. And I started taking, you know, um, these antidepressants. And, but the main thing that changed for me, everything changed for me to make that step when I started to accept that I was strong, that, you know, I was just like anybody else, but I was a strong person, that it wasn't a sign of weakness. And that made me see myself differently. And what it allowed me to do over a period of time was to navigate the company through a complete restructure, which meant one of the things, one of my biggest conflicts at work were all the promises that I had made to the staff and not letting them down. Mm. So mass redundancies, which was one way out of all the losses, was counterintuitive to everything I'd ever said. And maybe I just wasn't, you know, maybe that's what you do in business and I wasn't cut out for that. But by selling the businesses off piecemeal, the crown jewels, the money spinners, 
one at a time, I was able to protect those jobs in the main under 2P transfer of undertakings. So everyone that was employed kept a job. And that, for me, was a, it was one way out and not breaking my promises. I had spoken to the management team, a good team, you know, and said, look, if we make it through, because there were still lots of doubts, um, I will be relinquishing. There's an opportunity here for you guys to take this business and turn it into whatever you want, make it your story. My chapter with this business yeah. is done. I finally departed the company. And part of that deal was um, I ended up selling a couple of the freeholds of uh, the premises that we owned. So I had some money, um, some seed capital. And I teamed up with a developer and put that money, I invested that money into development. Um, did four developments, medium sized they, they weren't big developments. One was a luxury development of 12 flats mm -hmm. in Surrey. Another was uh, nine luxury homes, uh, also in Surrey. And one in Sussex. We did, I funded those. Um, and they all went well. I mean, they all made money. It was a new, new territory for me, but I yeah. learned quite quickly that I could make money that way. So we've got the, the, the property connection and, and that's actually a link to how we've met. Mm. Um, and we've got the Jack connection, J-A-A-Q, just mm. ask a question, the mental health platform that uh, we, we both invested in. Yeah. And I, I know that that's something that uh, has been a, a passion for both of us for, mm. from the journeys we've been on and are going through in life. But I'm, I'm going to thank you now because you've come on here and you've, you've been brutally honest about some tough, the, the toughest of times. You've also been able to just be open about the therapy, the effects that uh, that's had on you and the positive side of things. You battled, you know, you, um, you saw the people, the employees right through the, the journey of the credit crunch and exiting. And you've also said to us in, in the time we've been sitting together that you're as happy as you've ever been. I love my life. So you've come through it, you know, but I mean, yeah, don't, yeah, it's, it's been invaluable for me to be able to talk to you and I, I hope people watching can see that someone who started out with such a drive, such an ambition and took such a beating, um, you, you kept going, you kept going, you were persistent, you, know, you were consistent with your values, it's inspiring, so thank you. That was really sweet of you, thank you so much. Thanks Dave. Thanks ever so much Sean, it's yeah. been great, thank you.